Peace be with you. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Jesus via Mary. The best, surest, and the quickest way to the sacred heart of Jesus is through his mother, the Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate Conception. She's our mother too. Mary, our mother. Let's begin with a prayer. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that any one who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, we fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To you do we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, Despise not my petitions, but in your mercy, hear and answer them. Amen. Last week, you may remember, brothers and sisters, we were talking about the presence of God and living in the presence of God. And we're going to continue on that theme in just a few minutes. But first, I want to share something with you which is just totally almost out of this world. It's called a life offering prayer. And this is a life offering to Mary Immaculate. Now I'm going to read the prayer, which is short and rather simple, and then the five promises which Our Lady gave to a sister Elizabeth, who received the messages from Our Lady in the 1950s. These messages, by the way, are contained in a book entitled, a powerful book entitled, The Victorious Queen of the World you could probably obtain that on Amazon. You could check it out if you're interested. But the prayer and the promises is what I want to share with you right now. Here goes the prayer. My dear Jesus, before the Holy Trinity, our Heavenly Mother, and the whole Heavenly Court, united with your most precious blood and your sacrifice on Calvary, I hereby offer my whole life to the intention of your Sacred Heart and to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Together with my life I place at your disposal all Holy Masses, all my communions, all my good deeds, all my sacrifices, and the sufferings of my entire life for the adoration and supplication of the Holy Trinity, for unity in our Holy Mother Church, for the Holy Father and priests, for good priestly vocations, and for all souls until the end of the world. O oh my Jesus, please accept my life sacrifice and my offerings, and give me your grace that I may persevere obediently until my death. Amen. Now here are the five promises. And these apply to anyone who makes the life offering sincerely, meaning every word. Number one, their names will be written in the hearts of Jesus and Mary, inflamed by love. Their life offering, together with the infinite merits of Jesus, can save many souls from damnation. All souls who will live until the end of the world, will benefit from their life offering. Number three. None of their family members will go to hell, even if it seems otherwise, because they will receive in the depth of their souls the grace of sincere contrition before their soul departs from their bodies. Number four. On the day they offer their lives, their loved ones suffering in purgatory will be released. Number five, I will be with them at the hour of their death. They will not know purgatory. I will carry their souls straight to the presence of the glorious Trinity, where they will live with me in a special place created by God, and will rejoice forever. This is just totally awesome. 
If you'd like to get a copy of the prayer and the promises, just send me an email. Direct your email. Here's the address. To Jesus via Mary at AOL.com. To is T-O, Jesus, via, V-I-A, Mary, at AOL.com. And be sure to put on the subject line, Life Offering Prayer. And I'll send a copy of this right back to you. You can print it off and share it with your friends. And I strongly suggest that you make the offering yourself. This is just awesome. Last week we shared with you some of the excerpts from the writings of Father John Hardin, a Jesuit priest, concerning the presence of God and living in the presence of God. And we got our information from a website entitled therealpresence.org. And we contacted those folks and they graciously gave us permission to use some excerpts from Father Hardin on the radio program. There's a wealth of information at this website, and we strongly suggest that you check it out, therealpresence.org. We'll be coming back to Father John Hardin at a later time, but tonight, today rather, in order to uh, continue our discussion on the presence of God, we're going to switch gears a little bit and go to a Carmelite. Father Hardin was a Jesuit. Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection was a Carmelite. And I believe he lived toward the end of the 1600s. There's a book encompassing his way of life. It's called The Practice of the Presence of God. This was translated into English by Salvatore Sciorba. Uh, he's a Carmelite father. And the publication was put out by ICS Publications, Institute of Carmelite Studies in Washington, D.C. They're, on, uh, they're at 2131 Lincoln Road, Northeast. And they also graciously gave us permission to quote from uh, this book, some of the excerpts. Now these, I'm going to begin right now. Practice of the presence of God. Now this is practicing living in the presence of God, whereby he is with you constantly in a very special way. The holiest and most necessary practice in the spiritual life is that of the presence of God. It consists in taking delight in and becoming accustomed to His divine company, speaking humbly, conversing lovingly with Him all the time, at every moment, especially in times of temptation and suffering, weariness, and even infidelity and sin. All the time, we just talk to God. We must continually apply ourselves so that all our actions become a kind of brief conversation with God. Not in a contrived manner, but coming from the purity and simplicity of our hearts. We should perform all our actions carefully and deliberately, not impulsively or hurriedly, for such would characterize a distracted mind. We must work gently and lovingly with God, asking Him to accept our work, and by this continual attention to God, we will crush the head of the devil and force the weapons from his hands. During our work and other activities, even during our reading, no matter how spiritual, and even during our religious exercises and vocal prayers, we must stop for a moment, as often as possible, to adore God in the depths of our hearts, to savor Him, even though in passing and on the sly, 
to praise Him, to ask help, to offer Him our hearts, to thank Him. Nothing is more pleasing to God than for us to turn away from all creatures many times throughout the day in order to withdraw and adore Him present within us. We can offer God no greater evidence of our fidelity than by frequently renouncing and scorning creatures. Uh, let me stop there just for a second. We're not being asked to scorn creatures. We're being asked to scorn the influence from creatures that would take us away from the presence of God. I'll start that sentence again. We can offer God no greater evidence of our fidelity than by frequently renouncing and scorning creatures in order to enjoy their creator for a moment. This exercise gradually destroys the self-love only found among creatures. Turning to God frequently rids us of self-love without our even realizing it. This presence of God in the soul's life and nourishment which can be acquired by the Lord's grace are the means of great purity of life, keeping constant guard not to do, say, or think anything that might displease God. And when something like that happens, to humbly ask Him pardon and do penance for it. A great fidelity to the practice of this presence and to the fostering of this awareness of God within, which must always be carried out gently, humbly, and lovingly, without giving in to any disturbance. We must take special care that this inner awareness precedes our activities somewhat, that it accompanies them from time to time, and that we complete all of them in the same way. We must not get discouraged when we forget this holy practice, for all that is needed is to calmly take it up again. Once the habit is formed, we will find contentment in everything. In order to arrive at this state, mortification of the senses is essential, since it's impossible for a soul that still finds some satisfaction in creatures to completely enjoy this divine presence. For to be with God, we must abandon creatures. God desires to possess our heart completely. If we do not empty it of everything other than Himself, He cannot act nor do there what He pleases. He often complains of our blindness and cries out ceaselessly that we deserve sympathy for settling for so little. He says, this is Jesus, I have infinite treasures to give you, yet you are satisfied with a bit of perceptible devotion that passes in an instant. In this way we bind God's hands and half the abundant flow of His graces. To advance in the practice of the presence of God we should let go of all of our cares including a, a multitude of private devotions, good in themselves, but often carried out for the wrong reason. For these devotions are nothing more than the means to arrive at the end. If then we are with the one who is our end, by this practice of the presence of God, it is useless to return to the means. We can continue our loving exchange with Him, remaining in His holy presence, sometimes by an act of adoration, other times by acts of oblation, thanksgiving, or anything else that our minds can devise. We do not always have to be in church to be with God. We can make of our hearts an oratory, where we can withdraw from time to time to converse with Him there. Everyone is capable of these familiar conversations with God. A brief lifting up of the heart is enough. A brief remembrance of God 
an act of inner adoration, even though on the run with a sword in your hand, so to speak. These prayers, short as they may be, are very pleasing to God, and far from leaving us fearful, they strengthen us in the most dangerous of circumstances. Keep this in mind as often as possible. This manner of prayer is very necessary for a soldier, always exposed to threats to his life and often to his salvation. I just want to interject here that we're all soldiers because we're in a battle against evil, and it's going on all the time. And the little prayers that are referred to here in the writing, they're ejaculations, which I mentioned in an earlier program, one of which could be, Jesus, Mary, I love you, save souls. Another could be, most sacred heart of Jesus, may the whole world burn with love for you. Another would be, spread the effect of grace of your flame of love over all humanity. There are many. Now we'll continue. This practice of the presence of God is very helpful for mental prayer, for it will be easier to remain calm during mental prayer when the mind, not allowed to take flight during the day, is kept faithfully in God's presence. Since all of life is full of dangers and hazards, it is impossible to avoid them without God's constant help. We cannot ask Him for it if we're not with Him. We cannot be with Him unless we think of Him often. We cannot think of Him often except by a holy habit, the habit of keeping ourselves in His presence, asking Him for the graces we need at every moment. Nothing can comfort us more in life's trials and sufferings than this intimate conversation with God. Practiced faithfully, all physical illnesses will be easier to bear. God often permits us to suffer in order to purify our souls and make us remain with Him. If we are with God and want Him alone, we are incapable of suffering. We must therefore adore Him in our infirmities, offering Him our sufferings from time to time, asking Him lovingly, as a child does his father, to be conformed to His holy will and for the help of of His grace. These short prayers, the ejaculations, are very appropriate for the sick and are an excellent remedy for pain. Spread the effect of grace of your flame of love over all humanity. Jesus, Mary, I love you. Save souls. Most sacred heart of Jesus, may the whole world burn with love for you. Back to the book. Suffering is paradise as long as we are with God. This means we must become accustomed to conversing with God even when we are suffering and restrain our minds from wandering away from Him. When we are sick, we must keep constant guard over ourselves not to do, say, or think anything in an attempt to ease the pain that might displease Him. When we are attentive to God in this way, suffering will no longer be anything but sweetness, balm, and consolation. The worldly do not understand these truths, and I am not surprised because illnesses are considered as natural afflictions and not as graces from God. Those who regard them as coming from the hand of God as signs of His mercy and the means He uses for their salvation, ordinarily find great consolation in them. Well, that pretty much concludes our discussion of the presence of God and living in the presence of God, at least for the time being. And at this point, in case you tuned in late, I want to share once again a life offering prayer. This prayer was given by Our Lady to a nun in the 1950s. 
and it's a promise of us to Jesus through Mary and there are promises associated with it these promises were giving given to us by the Blessed Mother. Now the only restriction is that those making the life offering must sincerely mean every word in order for the promises to take effect. This is the life offering prayer. My dear Jesus, before the Holy Trinity, our Heavenly Mother and the whole Heavenly Court, United with your most precious blood and your sacrifice on Calvary, I hereby offer my whole life to the intention of your Sacred Heart and to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Together with my life I place at your disposal all Holy Masses, all my Communions, all my good deeds, all my sacrifices, and the sufferings of my entire life for the adoration and supplication of the Holy Trinity, for unity in Holy Mother Church, for the Holy Father and priests, for good priestly vocations, and for all souls until the end of the world. O my Jesus, please accept my life sacrifice and my offerings, and give me your grace that I may persevere obediently until my death. Amen. And here are the promises. Number one. Their names will be written in the hearts of Jesus and Mary, inflamed by love. Number two. Their life offering, together with the infinite merits of Jesus, can save many souls from damnation. All souls who will live until the end of the world will benefit from their life offering. None of their family members will go to hell, even if it seems otherwise, because they will receive in the depth of their souls the grace of sincere contrition before their soul departs from their bodies. Number four. On the day they offer their lives, their loved ones suffering in purgatory will be released. Number five. I will be with them at the hour of their death. They will not know purgatory. I will carry their souls straight to the presence of the glorious Trinity, where they will live with me in a special place created by God and will rejoice forever. Once again, I want to mention that if you'd like to get a copy of this prayer and the promises so that you can share it with your friends and make it yourself, which I strongly recommend, please send an email. The address is to Jesus via Mary at AOL.com. And make sure that you put on the subject line life offering prayer and I'll send one right back to you we talk an awful lot about Mary and the power that she has which was given to her by God and a lot of people don't accept Mary but you have to remember that while Jesus was dying on the cross he gave her to us as our mother he said woman behold your son and then he turned to John the Apostle and said, Behold your mother. He was talking to all of us. Behold your mother. Mary is our spiritual mother, given to us as mother by God. You may recall at the marriage feast of Cana when Mary said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. She was talking to all of us down through the generations. Do whatever Jesus tells you. And the same thing occurred here with Jesus on the cross. He gave Mary to us as our mother. For anyone who does not accept that, I'm sorry that you don't, and I'll pray that someday you see the light, because whether it's believed or it's not believed, it doesn't change the truth. 
Here's something that might help. Through the Incarnation, when Jesus Christ was conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the divine nature of the Son of God was united, and forever remains united, with the human nature of the Son of Man, such that the one divine person, Jesus Christ, is indeed both truly God and truly man. Mary is the one person ever to contribute, to truly give the one thing to God that was not already his, even as he first imparted it to her. It was something necessary to the final and perfect fulfillment of the will of God. In fact, it was the one thing that God created but did not possess. Apart from it, the suffering, crucifixion, death, and resurrection, which was absolutely necessary to the fulfillment of God's will for the salvation of the world and for the redemption of souls from bondage to sin and death, was impossible. Her very flesh. Mary assented to the will of God. She said her fiat. Jesus Christ took the substance of his sacred humanity from Mary. It was in this sacred humanity that Christ preached, healed, raised from the dead, gave sight to the blind. It's also in his sacred humanity that Christ suffered, was crucified, and died for our sins, and through which he purchased our salvation. Had Mary not consented to the will of God, had she refused to be the mother of the Son of God, who himself is one with the Father, the one thing absolutely necessary to our salvation, the flesh and the humanity, which Jesus Christ assumed, could never have been possible. God is a spirit, and spirit is not possessed of flesh, together with all the limitations inherent in flesh. God is infinite, flesh is not. God is everywhere present, flesh is not. God is perfect felicity, which is to say, God in himself has ever been, is, and ever will be perfectly happy, unassailed by suffering, and pain cannot touch upon him. But flesh is not. Through the Incarnation, through whom? Through Mary, who contributed her flesh, giving Christ, who had emptied himself of the form of God, to become the form of a servant, in fact, the suffering servant of Isaiah, through whom mankind was redeemed, only in the humanity that Christ took from Mary alone could he possibly suffer and even die. Well, we're about out of time. I'm going to say a prayer to Mary now. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Spread the effect of grace of thy flame of love over all humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee and for those who do not have recourse to thee. We hope that you'll tune in again next week, same time, same station. And we really enjoy chatting with you because we want to be with you. Tune in again. We'll have a lot of good information for you and we'll share it in a way that I hope you'll enjoy. You all take care now. God bless.